when I hear students, com let's say, complaining about that, oh, native speakers, they speak too fast. What they don't realize many times is that it's not so much about the speed per se, but native speakers tend to speak in a connected way. So we are going to be teaching you in today's lesson some of the main connected speech patterns that we see in English. It allows you then to embrace that curiosity of when you're watching something, listening to a podcast, anything else, of looking out for when you notice these. Also, to be able to decipher when you hear something that you have no idea what that was, you might be able to figure out that there's actually some connected speech happening there and figure out what it means. Oh uh, yeah, global citizens. This is Ethan from Real Life English, where every week our mission is to help take you beyond the classroom to speak confident, natural English, connect to the world, and actually use your English as the vehicle to living your greatest life. As always, I'm joined here in the global studio by the Brazilian who has more breadth to his lexicon than most North Americans. Thiago. <laughs> hey, everybody. Hey, Ethan. You're too kind, man. Thank you so much. Uh, what is lexicon, by the way? Lexicon is the words that one has in their vocabulary. So it's a, it's a fancy way of saying vocabulary. Awesome. And breadth? Breadth is another way you can say width. It's the, the area from side to side of something. Awesome. So breadth of lexicon, a wide array yeah. or range of vocabulary. Exactly. Amazing. And we also, it's not just the two of us today, we have our Ukrainian green thumb, Ksenia, joining us. How's it going, Ksenia? Hey, hello. I'm all right. Pretty good. Thank you. It's amazing to have you here. So for those of you that don't know Ksenia, Ksenia actually, oftentimes, if you send us an email or leave us a comment on YouTube, she might be one of the people who is answering you. She's one of the leaders of our Fluency Circle community, which of course is the community of students of our different fluency courses. And she is someone who has really mastered English language. She comes from Ukraine, but speaks just amazing, beautiful English and also is a teacher. So we're so pleased to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. I'm keeping improving my English together with our students every day. So yeah, <laughs> it's a nice opportunity to live your English daily with them. Most definitely. And what does it mean if someone's a green thumb, since you're a green thumb, Ksenia? Yeah. Is it someone who like, likes gardening? Because this would describe me, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, it's someone who has a knack for or a natural talent for things that have to do with plants. So if someone's a green thumb, in general, their plants flourish, their flowers bloom and so on. Someone who's not a green thumb, which probably is more my case, is that the, the plants don't bode so well. <laughs> and the thumb is this, this finger, right? On our arm. Right? Exactly. For those of you, if you're not watching on YouTube, she held up her big finger, which we call the thumb, but only yeah. on her hand. All right. So today we are going to be talking all about something that all of us have heard at one point or another from friends that are learning English or from our students saying, why is it that natives, native English speakers speak so fast? Now, Thiago, do you want to take a bat at answering this question? Yeah, sure. Um, when I hear students, com let's say, complaining about that, oh, native speakers, they speak too fast. What they don't realize many times is that it's not so much about the speed per se, but native speakers tend to speak in a connected way, using connected speech, as we say. And a connected speech is basically the art of cutting, reducing, and linking the words together in English. That's connected speech. So imagine you have a three-word sentence, but even though that sentence has three words, Usually, a native speaker will pronounce that as one sound only. Three words, one sound. So that's why it can get challenging for non-natives to understand native speakers sometimes. But if you learn the connected speech patterns and apply them, you will see how much easier it gets for you to understand and even speak fast English. By the way, Ethan, um, just to illustrate uh, connected speech in use here, I have here a phrase, and I'm going to read this phrase slowly or without connected speech and i would like i would like to ask you as a native to read that phrase using connected speech so the listeners can actually differentiate the difference here so the sentence i have here is 
I ran out of milk, so I'm going to go to the store. Yeah, it's pretty rare outside of like a, one of those classic recordings that you have in the classroom. This is when I first started teaching. I remember thinking this about the recordings, like no one speaks like this. So if you actually went to the USA, to the UK, or maybe you're watching a series or movie and they say this, they wouldn't say, uh, like Tiago said there, clearly pronounce every single word. Rather, they would say, I ran out of milk, so I'm going to go to the store. So everything, I didn't really say it actually, the time-wise, I didn't really say it in that much more, that much shorter of a time than Tiago did. But the thing is there is the words were just kind of flowing together. Some sounds get removed, some of them get morphed even. And so it doesn't sound like you might be prepared to be hearing the language if you've only studied in more traditional schools or if you haven't been exposed to much native English. I think that you even emphasize the most important words in the sentence, right? Reduce and your functional words. Most definitely. Yeah. It's something too that once you kind of learn some of the patterns, which we're going to talk about today, then you'll realize that actually it kind of helps to highlight the main message of the sentence. And many learners, I find panic about this because they want to understand 100%. And even our native languages, there's often times if you were to start watching, say, series or movies in your native language with subtitles in your native language, you might realize you're not picking up on every single word in the phrases, but rather because you're so accustomed to hearing it, your brain is just deciphering the most important information out of that. So that's you know, what we're doing in general is we learn these patterns connected speech that we hear all the time and then our brain is able to use that to pick out the most important message that's coming across. I just noticed yesterday, I was speaking to my nephew actually, who's like five, uh, five years old, and I caught myself, I, I said to him, Chidoon, which of course, he has no problem understanding that, right? He's only, he's only five years old, but that's often how we would speak in the States is say, to say, what are you doing? It's just four words, right? And it mm -hmm. becomes reduced down to Chidoon. We're going to talk about some of those, the patterns that are happening there later. But for me, uh, for most native speakers, right, this isn't something we're actually aware of in our speech. For me, this is something I learned about, as I mentioned, when I was in the, the classroom, uh, having my first teaching experience, I recognized that the recordings that I was supposed to use with my students, that they weren't natural. And then when I got into teaching more of my own, uh, you know, I started using more native resources, let's say, like TV series or maybe a funny YouTube video, maybe a clip from a TED talk. And I would point out these patterns to my students. And it was something in the early days of Real Life English, we were starting to decipher, starting to really pull apart how natives use connected speech so that we could teach that in an effective way. Because we found that once our students learned these different patterns that we're going to talk about today, then your comprehension just, you know, explodes. You can understand so much more. So... Tiago, I'd be curious, like when you were learning the language for yourself, how did you kind of go about understanding this? Yeah, uh, I think by now it's no secret that I relied a lot on movies and series back when I was learning English. And I started to notice these connected speech patterns in the movies and series I watched um, on the DVDs back then. And then little by little, I started to pick up on things like, oh, I don't hear a T here, like what are. I hear what are. Hmm, interesting. Mm -hmm. Or, oh, I don't hear easy to go. I hear easy to go. And then I started to apply also my musician ear by listening to those parts over and over again and repeating. And then little by little, I started to piece together and notice these patterns. It took me a while because I did it on my own. But eventually I got to a point where I could break down a lot of these patterns. And then I started teaching my students those patterns as well. Uh, I think nowadays is great because there are so many resources available online to teach you this stuff, connected speech. Back when I was learning, information wasn't that freely available. But for example, here on the podcast, we teach connected speech all the time. On our second channel, mm -hmm. on our other channel, Learn English with TV series, we teach a lot. So nowadays, you guys out there, you are so lucky <laughs> because you have <laughs> access to all this information, these connected speech patterns that uh, are taught online. So do take advantage of those. Uh, but yeah, for me, the movies and series and music, I would say, definitely played a role. Um, but I, I was actually curious to ask Xenia about that as well. Uh, Xenia, in her English learning journey, uh, 
how was it for you getting used to these connected speech patterns of the language? I had more formal education um, in English. So um, as Ethan told earlier, uh, it was more like from the textbooks. And of course, we had audio files, but um, maybe it wasn't as natural as it could be. Although I think the um, people who recorded those audios were native speakers of English. Uh, but I was lucky because we had some uh, young teachers at uh, my university, and they, on their lessons, added some music. So we were not so much watching movies as Tiago, but we were listening to a lot of music in English. And that's where I think I heard those examples of um, connected speech, like, I don't know, Wana or Gata, uh, those kinds of things. And this was good because I got familiar with that. And on the other hand, it kind of created a picture for me or an image that this is connected speech is something for the realm of music. That's why later <laughs> when I was, I don't know, speaking English or teaching English even, uh, I kind of felt um, awkward a little bit using it myself uh, because it wasn't natural for me, yeah? I'd rather use like, um, do you want to go or in a, instead of do you want to go? And later, if talking about my teaching experience, I noticed that uh, this as well, that even adult students uh, have so much, uh, like they, they struggle, adult students struggle with uh, understanding the sentence, like, for example, uh, I don't know, do you want to start with this exercise or like this, do you want to, or would you think, like, or would you say that, like, <laughs> When we combine two words and there is this new sound, uh, they kind of get confused, get lost. What are you talking? <laughs> What's the word there? <laughs> and even in using it, right, I feel a lot of people who maybe their whole life have been taught to speak in a certain way, they have a lot of trouble then starting to play around with connected speech. And, and that's okay. Of course, you don't have to use connected speech when you speak, but Actually, learning to use it can help you a lot with your comprehension as well. So we recommend at least, even if this isn't going to be a permanent part, play around with it a bit, right? That's a really mm -hmm. important part of learning the language is being willing to play. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, if, uh, if your goal is to speak fast, quote unquote, or faster, connected speech is definitely a key component to that. So it's something that is present mm -hmm. in native speech but also in no natives who have achieved a high level of fluency, all of them mm -hmm. use connected speech. So, you know, if you want to speak, let's say, with a high degree of fluency or even faster, yeah, make sure you use connected speech. I thought it was really interesting what Xenia was saying about feeling comfortable making these sounds. Maybe at first she didn't feel comfortable, but then little by little she started to feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. The comfort that has to come with practice. We're going to talk more about that. But mm -hmm. Ethan, I wanted to ask you, uh, as a learner myself, why? I mean, why do people speak? Why do natives speak with connected speech? C couldn't you guys just speak like in you know, a word for word? That'd be so much easier. <laughs> <laughs> I like that in asking that question, you said, couldn't you guys? Which is, is one, right? Couldn't, couldn't you? Couldn't you? Right? I mean, there <laughs> I am, you know, I'm betraying myself using connected but, speech. <laughs> yeah, it's, Probably something every learner at some point is kicking themselves about because it would be so much easier, right, if we didn't use this. But at the same time, for me, I've always seen language, learning a language, it's much more like art than it is like an exact science. And I think that's part of the art of the language, it's part of the beauty of it is every language uh, has its different way of flowing, different ways that the natives will playfully use the language, whether they're aware of it or not. This happens a lot in Portuguese, for example. Like when I was learning Portuguese, there's a lot of words that you guys cut and shorten, and I'm not sure exactly if it would be considered the same as connected speech, but certainly there's lots of reduction and lots of different ways of playing with the language that if you only study the language very formally from a textbook or something like that, you would not be prepared for the realities that Brazil would be throwing in your face. So that was certainly when I first arrived there, I felt completely lost until I started to pick up on some of these things that natives do. But anyway, that's a tangent. So. Um, Something really important to know about English is that it's what's called a stressed timed language. 
which several languages are stress time language, but many, uh, I forget what the, uh, they're, they're stress timed and there's a, another one which I can't remember what the term is. We'll share a video from Rachel's English because it's absolutely amazing in the description on YouTube or uh, wherever you're listening to this. But she breaks this down just so well. Basically what that means is that in English, we don't pronounce every syllable or every word with the same emphasis. So this creates the reduction of some syllables and the emphasis of other syllables. And you know, when we reduce some syllables, oftentimes it will link to other syllables, even if they're in a different word. And this is what creates the connected speech for us. So we saw before an example sentence, I ran out of milk, so I'm gonna go to the store. So you, if you just heard that, you can probably catch some of the words I'm saying. Maybe you heard ran, you probably heard milk, you probably heard go, you probably heard store. These are all what's called content words. But then we have other words that are, they're more fillers. You know, they, they add a little bit of color to the language. They help to provide some subtle information, but they're not so essential to get the full context of the sentence. And this is words like of, so, to. All these words get reduced. So out of becomes outa. To becomes ta. So becomes s or so, so I'm, so I'm. I have to actually think about that sometimes. Uh, so I'm, and yeah, th this happens all the time. Uh, sometimes in more intense ways, like, you know, I was pointing out, speaking to my nephew yesterday saying, Chidun, which most learners would not be at all prepared for, what are you doing to become Chidun? Uh, but yeah, do you wanna, I'll let you give another example. Yeah, sure. So we have here a nice phrase. We have, uh, I'm going to go to the bar tomorrow night and tell her we're done. That's the normal version, standard version, no connected speech. Now, Ethan, the connected speech version, give it to us. Uh, it's like the, the lower intermediate version and then maybe the upper intermediate advanced version, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go to the bar tomorrow night and tell her we're done. Fascinating. So I wasn't saying that particularly fast, right? But there's a lot of reduction there. So the content words we have is I'm go. There's actually go is twice there. Bar, tomorrow, night, tell. If you, uh, Oh, and done. And if you're just listening to audio of this, you might also want to check out the video because we'll be sure to use some graphics to illustrate this to you. It can be more difficult if you're just trying to paint it in your mind's eye, as we might say. And then we have function words, which are reduced. So we have to, the, and, her, we're. And so, you know, those all get reduced or linked to other words. So we have going to go, for example, becomes gonna go. We have to the bar becomes to the bar, to the bar. Or even we have an American T there, which we'll talk about in a bit, like go to the bar because it's between two vowel sounds, right? Uh, and then her, usually when we have her, him, them, they all reduce to er, im, um. So tell her becomes tell her, tell her. And mm. we're done. That also, instead of saying a full we're, it's we're done. So the schwa sound too is our best friend here. We've talked about that in other episodes. I won't go to length, but that uh sound, oftentimes when we reduce, you're gonna hear uh, some form of the uh sound showing up there. Yeah, that's so fascinating. So I think this shows the importance of learners not uh, depending so much on the written form of language. Mm. And I notice that a lot. Uh, I notice in my students that there is a, a high dependency on the written word on paper or on the screen. And if you want to really improve that, you're listening and speaking, you got to detach from that. You got to forget about the written version of the word and focus more on the sound, tuning in your ears to that. Just to give you guys an example, um, a common mistake that Brazilian learners make is the pronunciation of the regular verbs in the past with ed. So instead of worked, uh, learners go worked or play it instead of played. But why do they do that? Because they are reading the word on paper, let's say, and they think that it's just like our native language, Portuguese. So, oh, if it's here, if this E is here, I have to pronounce it. So I say work it and play it. But English is not like that. So it takes a while for them to get that sound and start going worked and played. Something else that I notice in my students sometimes is Sometimes we are working with a PDF file together. Uh, I have my copy, the student has his or her copy. And then 
when there are some questions there for us to talk about, and when I read the question from the PDF and the student is following along with his or her copy, usually I just ask the question once and the student is able to answer right away because the person got it. But sometimes I like to test them. I tell them to close the PDF and just listen to me asking the question. So when I do that, usually they don't get it the first time. So they ask me to repeat or to clarify, rephrase, or even I have to explain the question in a different way. This shows that there is this high dependency on what you see. So get more comfortable with your ears. It's like a safety blanket, you know? It's almost like the text on screen or on the PDF is a safety blanket. But if you really want to take your pronunciation and speak into the next level, remove that, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. Trust your ears more. And this is a habit. You know, it might feel uncomfortable in the beginning, but if you keep at it, uh, you will eventually start developing this ear for the language. It might take some time, but you will get there. I can relate to that, what Tiago was saying, because, uh, for example, right now, when I'm watching movies on Netflix, right, uh, there are certain movies, uh, certain actors who speak really, really fast. Tommy, when a pikey walks in with hair like that, you've got to ask yourself, have I made a mistake? And not to miss some words. Um, sometimes I may turn on English subtitles, right? Just like as a backup uh, to rely the safety blanket you were talking about. And what I notice is that um, our brain, yeah, it chooses the easiest way. So I start relying more on the text rather than listening to what actors are saying. And um, it slows down, yeah, the information inflow. So I sometimes miss what is said because I just like don't have enough time to read the whole sentence uh, before the next line shows up. Um, so then I choose to turn it off to get uncomfortable, but rather rely on the audio. And it also reminds me of what we were talking in our podcast before that uh, remember how kids uh, learn to speak, right? They don't read words to learn them. They hear the words. They repeat after mm -hmm. the parent, right? So the audio version comes first, and then we learn how to transform it into the letters, right? That's a really great insight about it. And as adults, obviously, we have more resources too, which is also an advantage than kids do. So... There are ways that we can use the text to be helpful for us, but you don't want it to become a crutch. You don't want it to become something that you rely on to understand. And I think there's kind of subtitles have gotten a bad rap. It means they've, they've gained a bad reputation in the language learning uh, world. Like you need to, in order to be advanced in language, you need to watch without subtitles instead of starting to see subtitles as a tool for learning the language which even I have gotten used to now watching series with English subtitles. <laughs> like if I'm watching a series in English, I, I usually watch it with subtitles just because I'm, I'm so accustomed to it. And I enjoy because I catch more things. Even as a native, sometimes I'll, I'll miss a detail. So mm. you shouldn't be ashamed of using subtitles is, is what I want to say here. And you should use that as a tool deliberately. And I think like... Uh, we were talking earlier about music, too, for this. You just said the word deliberately, and it reminded me of deliberate practice. What I recommended my students do is that, for example, if they watch, they want to, it's curious, they are curious, they want to check their comprehension. So first, they would watch a movie, like a part of a movie without subtitles, right, to see how much they understand. But then they would go and turn on subtitles to watch it second time with subtitles to see right, uh, to read and actually get um, the full text. So like you, you said, it's like very good tool to use like when you have this moment of deliberate practice. So we mentioned earlier about learning with music too, and that being a great resource because connected speech tends to be plentiful. It's like really languages like music. And there's this guy, Dao Zaness, I actually interviewed him uh, about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago. And he really embraces this this whole idea, this whole philosophy of English or all languages are like music. And he teaches that way. 
just through music, even if you're starting from zero, just to learn the sounds, the individual sounds, learning from a small part of a song. And so I highly recommend people check out that interview I did with him because he's just has a really mind blowing knowledge of all the all these aspects of of the sounds of the language and everything so like we were talking about how how kids learn and so on so there's some tips there that can really help you if you are one of those people who often feels lost when natives speak fast it can help you to start tuning your ear so you're more accustomed to hearing these different sounds and ultimately you'll increase your comprehension a lot so we've been kind of hinting at we are going to be teaching you in today's lesson about some of the the main connected speech patterns that we see in English. Because having knowledge about these, knowing that they exist, then it's kind of like Chiago was saying earlier, it allows you then to embrace that curiosity of when you're watching something, listening to a podcast, anything else, of looking out for when you notice these. And also to be able to decipher when you hear something that you have no idea what that was, you might be able to figure out that there's actually some connected speech happening there and figure out what it means. So we're going to start with one of the ones that's most common. A lot of you might already be aware of this, but uh, the what's called often the flat T or the American T, which is pretty much just a the, the, the sound. It's the same as the R in Spanish and in some accents of Portuguese, right? Like the R. Yeah, sure. We have some examples with that sound, the flap T. So for example, cat and dog becomes cat and dog. You see, cat and, cat and dog. Go to becomes go to. Go to, like go to the store. Or like Ethan said earlier, go to the bar. Go to the bar. Mm -hmm. Go to the bar. And the cool thing, guys, when you practice connected speech like that, you can practice slowly, by the way. You can practice slowly to get the sound. What, what matters is you're getting the sound. And then the speed mm -hmm. will come with time. So practice. Mm -hmm. Go to the bar. Go to the bar. Go to the bar. Go to the bar until your tongue is, your mouth is accustomed, and then you can increase yeah. the speed. But uh, you can even practice slowly. Even learning the collocations like that, like you're saying, like the go to the bar, go to, go to, go to. If you practice that go to, go to, go to, even if it's really slow, like Chago saying, you can use that in all sorts of things, right? Like uh, we're going to go to class. We're going to go to the store. We're going to go to the bar. We're going to go to have some food. We're going to be giving you a lot of examples today so you can start just practicing like those bits of the speech so then you can apply them in all sorts of different situations. Sure, yeah. That reminds me of a classic song from the Beatles, Come Together. And I noticed that while the Beatles sing Come Together with a T, Michael Jackson did a version of that song in the 80s and he goes, Come Together. Come Together. You know, like that. Come Together. Come Together. So it's nice to notice this stuff with music also. That's another one where it's like, if you notice come together, then you might also say, come to my party or come, come to the beach with me or something like that, uh, that you can apply it in all sorts of different situations. So we're going to be looking at several more connected speech patterns. How many did we have, Chago? We have about five, I believe. So we have five more that we're going to be looking at. But first of all, we wanted to make sure to take a moment to give a special thanks to a very special listener and app user. All right. The shout out goes to Zershida. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. And the review here goes, hi there. I'm blissfully happy because of my decision about downloading this app. Frankly speaking, those podcasts, flashcards, and opportunity to communicate with global citizens are just mind-blowing. It helps me a lot to enhance my English skills. Now I can easily get what native speakers say. Besides, my fluency has improved as well. I want to thank you for creating such a splendid, perfect English app in order to teach English to learners around the world, just like me. Oh yeah. Zorshira, you have amazing vocabulary here. I wanted to point out some things. And thanks so much for that shout out, of course. But they said, what, what does bliss mean? They said, I'm blissfully happy. So blissfully comes from blessing, something heavenly, magical. So I'm blissfully happy is like I'm magically happy, uh, the user is saying. And they also said mind blowing. They said that the opportunity to communicate with global citizens is just mind blowing. So what does it mean if something is mind blowing? 
Blowing is uh, an adjective. It's um, formed from two words. Yeah, to blow your mind. You can say it like that. Yeah, this just blew my mind. Yeah, or you can say that the experience was mind blowing. It means that it it's something extraordinary. It's something that surprises you, blows your mind, even exceeds your expectations. Right, depending right. on the the context. And finally, how about splendid? What does it mean if something is splendid? Yeah, something splendid is fantastic, amazing, incredible, fascinating. Well, certainly. So if you want to take your English to the next level, then I highly recommend that you check out the app. It is absolutely free to download in the Apple App Store or Google Play Store. You can, it's the only place really where anytime, anywhere, you can press a button and instantly connect to another English speaker in another part of the world. Maybe you can put your connected speech to practice with someone else. Maybe you can even teach someone else about some new connected speech that you learned. And of course, you get full transcripts for these podcast listens. So, you know, if you ever have trouble understanding us, it's a great way to be able to follow along and, you know, be able to pick up so much more of what we're saying and learn the best vocabulary from every single episode and never forget it with our advanced vocabulary technology and so much more. So, Check it out, download it for free, and we look forward to seeing you there. So as promised for the remainder of the podcast, we are going to be helping you to master some of the most common connected speech patterns in the English language. So first off, we're talking about the reduction of the H sound. Maybe you're wanting to get someone's attention. You might say, come here. Come here. But we would usually say that as, come here, come here. We completely drop that H sound there. Another example is, Pick them up. Pick them up! So we have with him, her, them, we tend to drop the beginning so it becomes im, er, um. So if I say pick them up, I'd say pick them up, pick them up. That th completely disappeared, right? And finally, also mentioned about him, right? Could say tell him. Tell him. To tell him becomes tell him or tell her. Amazing. Let me try that just to practice. And then you guys out there who are watching us can also practice together, watching or listening. Come here. Pick him up. Tell him. Very nice. Another common pattern here we have is the omission of the T in NT words. When you have this NT combination, especially in American English, that T tends to go away. Here are some examples. Internet becomes internet. International, international. Sentimental, sentimental. Went out, went out. In front of her, in front of her. Xenia, could you repeat those and, uh, you know, to give the chance for our followers to also practice? Yeah, let's try. Let's try together. So the first was internet, internet, international, sentimental went out and the last one is in front of her in front of her i thought that the, the sentimental that's pretty mind-blowing isn't it that it becomes it's got a, two of those so it's sentimental i think if i were learning english and i heard that i wouldn't piece together what word that actually is that's so true so the next example guys is the reduction of of which often becomes v or even the schwa sound uh like in the examples of kind of, kind of. Yeah, kind of. Could have becomes could have or coulda. Well, it could have been worse, right? Also, we can uh, say should have, should have, should have, would have, would have, or would have. Like in an example, like you yeah. could have told me, you could have told me, right? We even say... If someone is talking about, oh, I should have done this, I should have done that, they're, they're regretting a decision or something like that. Oftentimes in English, we'll say, should have, could have, would have. Kind of like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that boat has sailed, you know, it's in the past. Yeah. So move on. You know, when I was learning English, I used to watch this show from early 2000s called Smallville about mm. Superman when he was a teenager. And I remember vividly <laughs> until today. There was this scene, I think, in season one or two, where the main character, he says to his father, you should have told me. You should have told me. But at that time, I didn't get that. 
And then it took me a while to piece that together. Oh, should have told me. You should have told me. Yeah, that was incredible to find out. Do you want to imitate those with the audience, Chago? Yeah, sure. Let's do it, guys. So come on. Kinda. Coulda. Shoulda. Woulda. So next we have, I believe we mentioned this earlier, that sometimes we have actual morphing of sounds. And this is the case when we have a T plus a Y, usually we'll change it to a ch sound. So look out for this, for example, when you have the pronoun you, because it'll usually reduce. And if it has a T before it, we'll change it that ch sound. So for example, what you're saying becomes what you're saying. I know what you're saying. I don't want you to becomes I don't want you to. I don't want you to go. Got you becomes gotcha. <laughs> That's a really great one too. Gotcha. Like you can use that instead of saying, I understood. Say, oh yeah, gotcha. Especially I would say the, I don't want you to. I don't want you. I don't want you to, right? I think I've heard in, in movies, I don't want you to go. I don't want you to go. <laughs> Come back. <laughs> <laughs> that, that whole like, don't you, don't you. Mm -hmm. Or... Bad boys, bad boys, what you gonna do? What you gonna do when they come for you? There you go, I used yeah. to use that with my students a lot. It's that connection, right? What you gonna do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what you there's gonna also do? that song, Don't you wish a girl who was, you know? <laughs> Don't, you. <laughs> Don't you wish your girlfriend was hot like me? Uh, Xenia, <laughs> could you repeat those with the audience? Sure, let's try. What you're saying becomes what you're saying. I don't want you to, you see, I want to say, I don't want you. <laughs> I don't want you to, I don't want you to. Got you, gotcha, gotcha. Nice. And finally, something similar happens with D plus Y combinations. The sound here is more of a J, J sound with a J. So for example, would you often sounds would you, would you. Just like could you becomes could you, could you, and then should you, should you, should you. Um, another example of sentence here is how did you know becomes how did you know, how did. It? Notice mm -hmm. that also the D there for did, the first did, is kind of a flap D as well, da, da, just like the flap T. So how did mm -hmm. you, how did, it? how did you know, how did you know? I love the dramatization there. <laughs> Something else I thought would be worth pointing out here is that the you, you can say a full you, but oftentimes we even reduce you to ya. So in all of these cases, you could say a full you, but you could also reduce it to a ya. So you could say would you, but you could also say would ya, could ya, should ya, uh, did ya. And even with what we were talking about before with the T plus Y, with the ch, want ya, what ya, gotcha. So all those things you can, you can do either. Both are correct and you'll encounter native speakers, advanced speakers saying it in both those ways. All right, so I'm really excited for today's big challenge because we want you guys to get out of your comfort zone and start speaking. Actually put to practice what you've learned today. Do you wanna let them know what we have in store for them today, Chiago? Yeah, yeah, the big challenge today is Send us a voice message reading some of the sentences from today's episode out loud and reproducing the connected speech in them to the best of your abilities. You can send your voice message at speakpipe.com at real life English. That's speakpipe, P I P E dot com slash real life English, real life double L. Don't forget that. Or if you prefer, you can also send your voice message by email at hello at real life global dot com. Just remember to keep the message short, 30 seconds or less. We really appreciate that. We can also put that link in the description wherever you're listening to this and in the description on YouTube. So if you just want to click that link there and maybe if you even want to really step outside your comfort zone, if you're feeling especially courageous today after today's episode, maybe you could sing a small part of a song like Come Together or Bad Boys, Bad Boys, What You Gonna Do or... What was it? Don't you think your girlfriend? Yeah. Don't you wish your girlfriend was hot? Like, yeah. <laughs> any of those. They're all good ones. Or any other one that you choose. So, <laughs> all right. So, before we wrap up, I want to let you know that if you are enjoying these 
podcast lessons, either on YouTube or you're listening to it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere else, a free way for you to support us so that more learners can discover us and take their English to the next level with us is by leaving us a five-star review on your favorite app platform, like I mentioned, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else. This helps a ton. Or if you're on YouTube, subscribing to us. So all of these are free ways that you can get the word out to more learners. And remember that no matter what divides us, that which unites us is far greater. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode of the Real Life English Podcast. One, two, three. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. It was always very important to me as a learner to understand the meaning of my favorite songs. You know, that actually prefaces very well what we're going to be discussing today, which is the importance of understanding the actual meaning of the songs you like. So not just listening to a song in English to practice maybe pronunciation or listening in general, but actually understanding what this song is talking about, what the message is there.